Welcome to lecture 11 in our second semester class on stochastic processes. Today we want to introduce the uh, Poincaré inequality to the study of stochastic processes. The Poincaré inequality is a known inequality which is used in PDE theory and also in analysis uh, of uh, geometric spaces in general and we want to discuss its significance in the context of stochastic processes. So here's our definition of a Poincaré inequality or the validity of a Poincaré inequality, which is a property of a semigroup or a property of a, an associated stochastic process if the semigroup is uh, connected or associated to a Markov process. Namely, let uh, A, D of A, be the generator of a fellow semigroup on a certain topological space. And suppose we have a symmetrizing measure mu, a non-negative symmetrizing measure, then we say that this generator or the semigroup satisfies a Poincaré inequality with respect to that measure with a certain Poincaré constant Cp if the following inequality holds true, namely if the L2 norm of any function when computed with respect to that symmetrizing measure, if that L2 norm of that function is bounded from above by a constant times the inner product of the function with a negative of the generator in that weighted L2 space. If that's true, for all functions which are in the domain of the generator and which additionally satisfy the requirement that the mean value of the function with regards to that measure is zero. This is what we call a Poincaré inequality. So if that's true for all those functions which are in the domain of the generator, and which vanish in mean value, then we say that the Poincaré inequality holds true and this constant on the right-hand side of this inequality is then called the Poincaré constant. Uh, just a few comments before we start the analysis and the significance of this inequality. Uh, namely, if we look onto the right-hand side of this inequality, we would probably want to make sure as a first step that the right-hand side actually is uh, non-negative. In order to convince ourselves of this, we use um, the fact that uh, by the definition of the generator of this uh, of this semigroup, we can write this inner product f with a f in mu. We can write this as the limit of this difference quotient. But we have seen that the PT operation in the case of an invariant uh, measure is an L two contraction. So therefore, it's easy to convince yourself that this is actually a non-negative number, so therefore the generator as an operator on this L2 space is in fact a non-positive operator, so therefore if we write on the right-hand side this inner product of this of the negative of this non-positive operator, um, we actually get a non-negative operator, so therefore the right-hand side uh, is actually non-negative on this, in, in this inequality for any function f which is in the domain of the generator. And secondly, as a notation, uh, we sometimes write for this quadratic form f against af in the mu inner product. We sometimes uh, denote this by this curly eff. This is a bilinear or quadratic form on this L2 space, uh, which can also be the starting point of, of a theory of its own. So we could also develop the whole theory of stochastic processes starting not only or not from the generator, but basically starting from this quadratic form. This leads then to the theory of symmetric Dirichlet forms, which are associated to the semigroup, which is another take on the construction of stochastic processes, but that would be uh, the subject of a, um, of a separate series of lectures, which um, I shall not include in, in, this, in this course. So anyway, this notation nevertheless is sometimes useful, even if we don't want to dive really deeply into the theory of Dirichlet forms, which simply just replace this um, quadratic form, which it is, as a matter of fact, on the right-hand side by this notation EFF, uh, as usual. Our first proposition of this segment gives a reason why we are interested in Poincaré constants in the concept of stochastic processes. Namely, suppose we have a reversible Feller process on a topological space that satisfies a Poincaré inequality with a certain Poincaré constant Cp, which is a finite constant, which is to say that the corresponding generator 
satisfies a Poincaré constant with respect to that reversible measure. Then we have the following, uh, in fact, contraction estimate, namely then for all functions f which are in the domain of the generator, it holds true that if we compute the function under the action of the heat of the semigroup PT, and if we measure the distance of this new function towards the constant function, which is just the constant value given by the mean value of that function f, and if we measure that the distance of these two functions in L2 sense, L2 with regards to that weighting measure mu, then this distance is exponentially small in time where the exponential decay rate is given by the inverse of that Poincaré constant and where at time t equals zero of course the left hand side uh, equals just the variance of the square root of the variance of the function f in that uh, measure mu and here I should probably recall that the variance here in our notation, the variance, again, of the function f with regards to the measure mu here on the right-hand side. That's the usual expression. It is the L2 norm squared of the function minus the mean value of that function with regards to the measure mu squared. So that's the variance, and that's exactly the expression that appears on the left-hand side when we evaluate that expression at time t equals zero. So let me say the statement again. If we have a reversible Feller process, say, and if the generator satisfies a Poincaré inequality with Poincaré constant Cp, then it is so that any function, any observable under the action of the semigroup converges exponentially fast to a constant function where the constant equals the mean value of that observable with respect to that invariant measure. And the convergence is measured here in L2 sense, where the convergence rate, the exponential convergence rate, is the inverse of the Poincaré constant. So this is a statement about, the, is, is one quantitative statement about the speed of convergence of the semigroup towards the invariant measure. It is an exponential convergence. And if we consider this in the case when we are dealing with gradient diffusion processes, which was um, basically our main example in the previous segment, then we see that if we can verify a Poincaré constant for these gradient diffusion dynamics and for the corresponding generator, then we have exponential convergence of this stochastic process towards the equilibrium distribution when measured in terms of observables. And when, measured, uh, when we measure this, the effect of this stochastic process on observables in the L2 sense, as stated in the theorem here above. So the significance, let me say it again, is that it gives us a quantitative statement about how fast the stochastic process that we construct actually approximates the given equilibrium distribution, which is of in this exponential type, if we talk about these gradient diffusion dynamics. And therefore, in particular, if you want to use this gradient diffusion dynamics to produce statistical samples from the Gibbs distribution, such a statement as here is very useful because it tells you how long you have to simulate the process in order to get something which is so and so close to the actual expected value which you want to compute. So what you really want to do, typically, or in many cases, when you do really equilibrium statistical mechanics, is you want to compute actually this quantity here, which is uh, the constant in this inequality. So you want to take the average observation under an observable f, when you take the average with respect to a certain Gibbs distribution of a certain statistical mechanical ensemble, say, and sometimes it happens that this statistical ensemble is actually impossible to simulate or almost impossible to simulate, and what you do instead is that you 
construct a diffusion process which has the exact Gibbs measure as an invariant distribution, and then you let the diffusion process run for a while, and you evaluate your observable by means of this finite time diffusion process. And then, of course, you would want to know how far, on average at least, your given mean value or your mean, mean uh, observation on the stochastic process after time t, how far it is away from the actual number that you want to compute. And this estimate here gives you a first estimate on this on the size of the error that you that you uh, are uh, facing, at least when you measure the size of the error in this L2 sense. So therefore, a Poincaré inequality is very useful. It's a very useful first quantitative statement regarding the speed of convergence of your stochastic algorithm, if you want, if you want to use that stochastic process in order to sample from a given fixed distribution. The proof of this exponential contraction is not complicated. I write down the quantity that I want to estimate. It's the difference in L2 of the function PTF and the constant function, which is uh, the constant given by the mean value of the function f in the measure mu. And uh, I realize that this mean value of the function f is just the same as if I write the mean value of the function f uh, of the function ptf against the mu because uh, a mu is invariant under the action of uh, um, pt. And if I insert this pt operator into that mean value operation and write down what it actually means, I'm getting this uh, integral of ptf minus this constant and what I see by the standard formula for variance, or which I've just uh, introduced, that this is nothing but the variance of the pt function, ptf function, against the measure mu. Now since I want to establish an exponential decay statement for this variance. It's actually the quantity I'm looking at. It's natural to consider the time derivative of this quantity. So that's the time derivative of an integral of a function which is squared, and this function depends on time. So if I, which I'm allowed to do, uh, hit this integral of a square depending on t, um, by interchanging the time differentiation and the integration and using Leibniz rule, I'm making twice the product of the derivative of this function with a non-differentiated function, but the derivative of this function uh, here is uh, the derivative actually of the semigroup operating on the function f, so we know that this is a uh, of ptf then integrated against ptf minus mu f in mu. And uh, since the process is assumed to be uh, reversible, we also know that it is invariant, which means that uh, the A operator acting on the function 1 uh, produces a 0. So therefore, this constant here on the right-hand side will not contribute to this integral, and I can write uh, the right-hand side equivalently as A operating on PTF against PTF in the L2 mu inner product. But what I see here now is exactly the negative of the, this Dirichlet form, if you like, which we had just introduced. And by the Poincaré inequality, I know that I can replace this number here on the right-hand side. I can bound this number from above by <clears throat> the negative of the variance of this PT function in the mu measure at the expense of this inverse Poincaré constant. So this is just feeding in the assumed Poincaré inequality to this, uh, to this um, uh, equation. And so we see that the time derivative of this variance is bounded from above by minus 2 over the Poincaré constant times the variance of that function. Uh, times that, that, that is exactly that quantity, 
which uh, allows us to apply the Grunwald inequality to this uh, function and uh, which ultimately gives the claim that this quantity psi of t, if you call this guy psi of t, what we have just established, let me say it again, we have established that d by dt psi of t is less or equal than minus 2 over cp times psi of t, of course, and that calls for the use of Grunwald's inequality, which yields the claim that psi actually is exponentially decaying. Uh, but since uh, here the psi is actually the square of the quantity that we want to look at, uh, we establish uh, the inequality which was in the claim. Well, uh, so a the, the few more remarks before we uh, try to derive criteria or establish criteria which allow us to verify that such a Poincaré constant or Poincaré inequality actually is satisfied by at least a certain class of examples of diffusion processes. So these following, I want to make the following remarks. So CP is called the, the Poincaré constant, is sometimes also called the spectral gap. Uh, uh, because it basically um, describes uh, the, it gives a lower bound on the first non-trivial eigenvalue of this uh, operator A. And I should also say that this inequality regarding the decay of the variance uh, by a simple approximation argument, uh, you will find that this decay of variance is correct also, not only for all functions which are in the domain of the generator, but also for general functions which are in the L2 space. That's just a simple approximation argument. Uh, this is true because the domain of the generator is uh, dense in this L2 space. And now we want to move on to the question whether we can provide criteria under which a Poincaré constant or a Poincaré inequality can be verified. And we will focus on now on this gradient diffusion case. Um, we start out by establishing uh, the Poincaré inequality for a very specific situation, namely when you consider just a Brownian motion on a Euclidean ball. And here the statement I would like to make is the following, namely let R be a given positive radius and consider the Euclidean ball of size R, of radius R in d-dimensional space. And suppose you have a function which is uh, continuously differentiable, and we want to consider the normalized Lebesgue measure on that ball. So it's just a probability measure which co corresponds to the uniform distribution on the ball. Then um, I claim that the variance of any function, of such a function which is smooth and has a derivative, this is bounded from above by a certain constant which depends on the dimension times the radius squared times the L2 norm on this ball of the gradient of that function squared. So this is a version of the Poincaré inequality, although here in this way it's not yet really associated to any generator of any diffusion. Here it's just the PDE version of a Poincaré inequality, which does not make any reference to any generator. It just says that the L2 norm of a function on a ball is uniformly dominated by the L2 norm of the gradient of the function on that ball, provided, for instance, the function f has mean value 0 on the ball. So recall that the variance of the function on a certain piece of Euclidean space is, of course, just the L2 norm if we assume that the mean value of that function is 0. So that's uh, then what it says in analytical terms. The L2 norm of a function on a ball which has mean value 0 is dominated from above or is bounded from above by the L2 norm of the gradient of that function where there is a certain bounding factor which depends only on dimension and the size of the ball. This is the classical, this is a version of a classical Poincaré inequality as you might see it in your analysis lecture. And we shall make use of this property of Euclidean balls, of the Poincaré inequality for Euclidean balls, for the discussion of general diffusion processes. And I want to sketch the proof of this Euclidean Poincaré inequality before we move on to the diffusion process case.
So here is a sketch of this Euclidean Poincaré inequality for balls. So the variance is usual of a function f or of any random variable. We just do one preliminary computation for that, um, which will yield us an expression of the variance of any random variable, in fact, in terms of a double integral, which is classical and helpful in this context. So let's do that. Suppose you have some uh, measure and you um, and probability measure on some space and you want to consider a random variable and you can compute the variance, then this is, as you know, the <clears throat> uh, the L2 norm of that function in mu minus the L1 norm squared or the L1 integral or mean value is squared. Now we can uh, write down what that actually means. So the first the first part is just F squared integrated against the measure mu. And the second part is square of first order integrals we just write uh, as the product of two numbers of course which are correspond to each of the integrals but of course this product of these two numbers we can also interpret as a double integral of a function which is you know, the product f of x times f of y and so there's a function of two variables which we integrate over the product space against the product measure and we can also write this first integral artificially as an integral with respect to a product measure and we take the function which is just in two variables uh, the square of the x of function f in the x variable and we integrate that again against this product measure where here this second integral of course does not contribute because uh, it's uh, the function f does not depend on this y variable but since mu is assumed to be a probability measure it does not spoil okay and then we um, write this guy here artificially as an integral with respect to the x variable squared as an integral of the y variable squared which produces twice the same expression but once with an x and once with a y variable so therefore i write that here and here this one half factor is consumed by this two which i in insert in order to write this second sum in or, um, into this joint integral in x and y now and now finally uh, by a binomial formula I see that this f squared of x plus f squared of y minus 2 of x and of y is nothing but fx minus fy um, squared. So therefore I've managed to write this variance as a double integral in two variables uh, and this uh, where, where in, the, in the function I need to integrate is the difference of x and f and x and f and y squared. Now that already calls somehow for the invocation of the gradient and now I'm in going to the specific case of the Euclidean situation where I um, want to integrate over these balls against uh, the Euclidean measure and the balls will be normalized so I'm having this um, factor this factor of the total volume of the Euclidean ball uh, in the square in front and this difference here, now if I assume that the function f is smooth, I can expand this difference just by a fundamental theorem of calculus, by a segment integration. So I just do a connection between x and y along the segment. So if this, this is my, my balls, so I have two points in the ball, then I just um, have these, this difference of f evaluated in these two balls, in these, um, in these two points. And I can evaluate this difference also by just doing a integration of the gradient along the segment that connects the two points. That's just uh, by fundamental theorem, just an equivalent way to express this difference. And now I'm having three integrals, in fact. So I'm having an integral with respect to time and two spatial integrals. And the next step is to uh, apply um, Hölder's inequality or Jensen's inequality with regards to this time integration, which allows me to pull in the square operation inside the time integral at the expense of an inequality. Now x and y are chosen from the r sphere here in the integration, so therefore the difference is bounded from above by r squared. It's a convex set. And uh, the next step is to, for the estimate that is going to follow this, um, <clears throat> I want to basically apply some uh, transformation formula for this uh, integral in, in x and y coordinates. So I interchange, I will, in, in one of the next steps, I will interchange the time integration and one of the spatial integrals here, 
and for that matter it is useful because uh, this <clears throat> this scaling here this is if to be understood now as a spatial scaling of this difference x and y so i will apply some euclidean transformation formula and the scaling gets uh, worse and worse when s is small so i will uh, decompose this time integral into sub sub intervals where the time ranges this s parameter ranges from one to an half one to an and a half and the second part will be when the S parameter ranges between one half and one. That's just an additive decomposition of this time integral, and I'll denote these two time integrals with one and two. Let's have a look at the first of these two integrals. This one corresponds to the part of the time integration on the interval from zero to one half. So this is in total an integral in three variables and uh, I will now interchange the y integration and the s integration which I'm allowed to do by Fubini's theorem. So fixing the s and the x and doing an integral of this function over the r ball with respect to the y parameter effectively yields, if you look at what is happening here, it effectively yields an integral, so the function f is evaluated through this transformation inside in its argument, the function f, when we do the integration with y, in, with regards to y, then the function f, or gradient f, is evaluated in total on a ball of size 1 minus s times r, which is then centered at the center as x. That is the effective domain of integration on which the function grad f is integrated when we perform the y integration alone. But of course, <clears throat> this effective domain of integration is then the domain which we need to write in this uh, alternative representation, but by doing so, in fact, we had um, invoked the transformation formula for integration in d-dimensional Euclidean space, which we know comes up or comes at the expense of a certain functional determinant, which in this case is the number 1 divided by 1 minus s to the power d, where d is the mid-dimension and where we work. That's just the Euclidean scaling of integrals. Now, by the convexity of the balls, this domain over which I do the integration of gradient f squared in the z variable, this domain is still contained in the full Euclidean ball around the origin. Since x is in that ball, the linear combination of a z, which is from uh, 1 minus sr and sx, then this linear combination will still be in the Euclidean ball, which is centered at the origin and which has radius r. So therefore, this whole integral here, of course, is bounded from above by the integral over that uh, containing <clears throat> that containing set or this, this superset. And we see that this function, this remaining function, which we have here, which is to start with the function both in s and x, has an upper bound which does not depend anymore on s and x alone, so therefore I can pull this upper bound in front of the integration and I'm left with an integral over the s and x variable. I see that the inner function does not depend on the, uh, on the x, so therefore the x integration produces just the size of the domain over which I have to do the remaining integration in x. And what remains is this integral in the s variable, which can be computed explicitly and gives this constant. So therefore I have managed to estimate one of the two guys by an expression which uh, is appearing on the right-hand side of my Poincar inequality. And as for the second integral with regards to s, which ranges in the interval from one-half to one, 
I do the exactly the same argumentation, but now with the roles in X and Y interchanged, which uh, produces an, an integral with respect to S that uh, is 1 over 1 over s over the, the, the integral from 1 half to 1, which is uh, exactly the same integral. But by interchanging roles in x and y, I managed to evade the singularity of this transformation at s equals 1 or s equals 0, um, respectively. So, in particular, if, you, if I combine the two estimates for these sum in 1 and sum in 2 all together, um, um, then I obtain the claimed Euclidean Poincaré inequality for finite balls. We can now use the same arguments effectively to discuss a Poincaré inequality for Euclidean balls, but not with respect to the flat Euclidean measure, but probably with a measure which is weighted, which comes with a weighting factor. So if we consider this, the generalized case of a measure or of a Euclidean Poincaré inequality, but now not using the flat Lebesgue measure, but a weighted Lebesgue measure, which has the form that it's Lebesgue times a Radonikodim derivative with a weighting function h, and which uh, we might or might not uh, normalize to produce a really probability measure on the ball. So z would be just a normalizing constant in order to produce through this representation a probability measure on the Euclidean ball of size R, then by a similar argumentation, which I leave as an exercise, we can also conclude that also uh, we have a Poincaré inequality in this case for this weighted Lebesgue measure, which um, has a Poincaré constant, at least one Poincaré constant, which is the same as the Euclidean flat constant times an additional factor, which is the ratio of the maximum of h on that ball by the minimum of h on that ball. That's at least one estimate for the Poincaré constant in this case, and I leave it as an exercise. There might be better estimates, but what we want to claim th through this corollary is just that it also weighted uh, measures uh, on the flat Euclidean space on finite balls satisfy a certain Poincaré inequality. And we will make use of that fact down below. So a few more um, comments. The normalization is irrelevant. You can convince yourself easily that uh, the inequality is independent of the choice of the normalization because it's a normalizing factor which appears on both sides of the inequality. So it is scaled out of this inequality and, in, and as a consequence it doesn't really matter whether you do the discussion with or without a normalizing factor. And uh, finally we say that any measure on uh, any non-negative measure on the Euclidean space satisfies a Poincaré inequality on a finite ball, that's what we shall say, uh, with a Poincaré constant kr, if it is so that the L2 norm of the function on that ball, when computed with that measure, is bounded from above, by a Poincaré constant kr times the gradient in L2 norm squared on that ball, again measured with that measure mu. So if that's the case for all functions f, which have mean value 0 with regards to that measure, then we say that the measure mu satisfies a Poincaré inequality on this ball of size r with Poincaré constant kr. This will be the terminology that we shall use in the next proposition, which gives a sufficient condition for a Poincaré inequality on the full Euclidean space for diffusion processes to hold. We can now state the main result of this session, which is a positive criterion for the validity of a Poincaré constant for drift diffusion dynamics. So we consider the Euclidean process obtained by solving a stochastic differential equation of standard form where the drift vector field is actually given as a gradient of a certain energy function h, as we shall say. We know that there is a candidate for an invariant measure, which is uh, this Gibbs measure, which is the weighted 
Euclidean measure with the weighting factor of the exponential of minus h, and want to assume that h is chosen in such a fashion that the solutions exist and give rise to a fellow process. Let us denote its generator by a with its domain d of a, and we know that on sufficiently smooth functions, <clears throat> the generator is given as this second-order partial differential operator, where the Laplacian accounts for the diffusion, and the gradient uh, f is um, applied to, or is taken in the inner product with the gradient of h, where h is this energy function, which uh, defines the stochastic differential equation. The condition that we shall formulate below is again a, a condition based on the Lyapunov type function, so we want to find a certain function which satisfies certain properties under the action of this operator A, and that will allow us to make some conclusions. Recall that we had this Lyapunov function approach already in the context of the existence of invariant measures, and now we use again the Lyapunov function type argument uh, to uh, demonstrate that uh, the Poincaré constant is finite. Okay, so in our case, the Lyapunov function will be called W, and we want to assume we have a function W, which <coughs> satisfies the following properties, namely that um, basically AW is bounded from above by minus theta of W, at least on sufficiently large balls. This is uh, kind of reminiscent of the condition that we had for the existence of invariant measures, but we want to make uh, not so strict assumptions on the behavior of this aw on the uh, on the certain compact subset so therefore we want to say that on a certain um, ball of size r this aw is bounded from above at least by some constant and maybe by the indicator function on that ball times a constant and this is the condition that we want so we want that the that the function w is uh, bounded from below by a strictly positive constant delta on that ball and then we want that the outcome of what we obtain when we apply this PD operator to the function omega, a correction w, we want that this is bounded from above by minus a theta omega plus this indicator function times a constant. Then, and that's the, the um, assertion, then it is so that the invariant measure, basically the unique invariant measure <clears throat> that we have in this case, which is this exponential exponentially weighted Lebesgue measure, which is also sometimes called the Gibbs measure, then this Gibbs measure satisfies a global Poincaré inequality, so a fully clean space, with a Poincaré constant, which is given by 1 over theta plus uh, times 1 plus uh, b over delta times kr, where uh, kr, I should say, kr is the Poincaré constant, <coughs> that's the Poincaré constant for mu on the ball of size r. So, we have seen that <clears throat> typically a measure on a finite ball, if the measure has a density which is sufficiently nice, nicely behaved, then that, that function, or that, that corresponding measure will satisfy a certain Poincaré constant on this ball. That's the number kr that, that is appearing here in the statement. And if we moreover <clears throat> find now a function W, which satisfies this particular Lyapunov type condition, then we can assert that the process, as a process on the full Euclidean space, satisfies a Poincaré inequality. This is a kind of flexible and uh, very general approach to show that at least there is some Poincaré inequality. This approach might not lead to the best estimates that you may think of, but it is through this Lyapunov condition or the Apunov function, it is quite general, and we can apply it in many situations. And this result of this criterion for a finite Poincaré constant for the diffusion case was established kind of only recently, in 2008, by uh, the French mathematicians uh, Bacri, Barthes, Cartier, and Gulin. The proof of this statement is now not so complicated anymore. <clears throat> We consider a general function f on Euclidean space, of which we assume for a moment that it is L2 integrable with respect to the measure mu, and we want to assume that the measure is continuously differentiable, that the function is continuously differentiable. So then we consider the L2 norm 
of that function in this in this uh, uh, measure mu and rearranging the inequality <clears throat> that we want to assume for the function w which is this uh, defining the upper of inequality in our given situation we can rearrange this inequality and solve it for w and then ultimately divide by w which produces or divide by theta w which produces a statement that the one the constant one function is bounded from above uh, by <clears throat> minus a w over theta w plus b times 1 the indicator of this ball divided by w so rearranging this inequality here and solving for <clears throat> w and then dividing by theta w produces this upper bound of the constant one function and I can <clears throat> insert this upper bound for the constant one function in this integral which produces the sum of these two integrals as an upper bound for the L2 norm of the function f. Now I will consider these two integrals separately. The first of these two integrals <clears throat> Uh, can also be written as follows. So I'm, I'm writing this um, minus a w over theta. I'm, I'm writing this one over theta in front of the of the integral, and then I re rearrange this. Can also be written as an a w integrated against the f squared over the w. And now I use integration by parts, which tells me that whenever I have minus the operator a in this particular case, so minus a of f times g. That's in computation that we did when we were asking for symmetry. Minus a times uh, minus a f times g integrated against the measure mu. If you look up the computation that we did, that always has allows for the representation of gradient f times gradient g d mu. So this is our, again our Dirichlet form, f and, applied to the function f and g. So using this computation, we can map this, or we can convert this second-order differential operator, which acts on the w, in the integral to be just the product of the corresponding gradients of the two functions, which enter uh, in this integral. So that's what we did here. We just do one integration by parts according to the Gauss formula, if you like, using the symmetry of A with respect to the measure of u, produces exactly this formula here. Now on the right-hand side, or the second factor here is the gradient of a product. And we can use a Leibniz rule to expand this gradient. So it gives us two terms. One is the gradient acting on the f squared. So gradient of f squared is 2 times f times uh, gradient. And that comes with the 1 over, one over w. That's here. And then the second, uh, the second part will be the gradient acting on the 1 over w. The gradient of 1 over w is a minus 1 over w times gradient w. And if you compute that or uh, take the inner product of this with a gradient w, you end up with this expression. So this is just expanding. This is just what you obtain when you expand this gradient uh, as a gradient acting on the product of these two functions. Now we have a look at these different <clears throat> components. We see that here we have a 2 times something which we identify as a mixed product of f over w times gradient of w times gradient f. And here we have, <coughs> if, if, if you call this this uh, guy z, and if you call this guy, uh, I don't know, uh, v, then what you find here is that this is the z vector field uh, squared. And here you have the v, so therefore what you see here is... Um, uh, a, a part of the binomial formula for the difference squared of two vector fields. Uh, so what you obtain is that this is the same as the minus of z minus, uh, correction, that would be <coughs> v minus z squared plus, in this case, the v squared. Okay, so that's just uh, <coughs> binomial formula and point-wise for these two terms, so that uh, in the end you get these that you get these two parts 
And uh, since you are interested in an uh, upper bound, you can neglect this negative part to arrive at an upper bound by 1 over theta times the gradient of f squared. That's already very good. So we managed to produce an estimate of the first of the two parts uh, in a way which fits to our Poincaré inequality. And so therefore we take a look at the second part. Let's have a look at it again. So the second part is the integral over this <coughs> r ball of f squared times b over theta omega. But we wanted to assume <coughs> that the omega function, a correction to the w function, is bounded from below by a positive constant of uh, delta. So therefore, including, or in, including this inequality into the integral in a pointwise way produces an upper bound on this second integral like this. And now comes in our Poincaré inequality that we wanted to assume for the measure mu on this finite ball of size r, which we can verify under very general conditions. So if we call that Poincaré constant kr, we can estimate this integral of the function f squared on the, on the ball r, on the r ball with, with regards to the measure mu by kr times the gradient of that function squared against the mu. But of course we have <clears throat> to be careful because the Poincaré inequality is correct only in, in, in the way that we stated it for functions which have mean zero. So therefore we have this additional part which is the mean value of the function, the potentially non-vanishing mean value of the function f on that ball which uh, is showing up here in, in, in the square. So this is just by inserting uh, the presupposed Poincaré inequality for the measure mu on the R ball when applied to the function f. And now <clears throat> we want to uh, get rid of this additional term here, so therefore we make a replacement. We, we now pass, we now assume that the function f is in fact given as a function g minus c. So it's just a shift uh, of a certain function g, where the shift by a certain shift constant c, the constant here is chosen to be exactly the mean value of the g function on the ball. So this shift, if we assume that f has this form, if we assume that f has this form, then by uh, construction the f mean value with respect to the measure mu on the r ball vanishes. So therefore, the term here on the right-hand side does not appear, it does not appear or does not contribute. And we have that the gradient of f, of course, is the gradient of g, since the two functions uh, differ only by a constant shift. So inserting <coughs> this representation of the function f as a shift of, a, of another function g, we end up with the following inequality, if we plug the first, uh, the two estimates for the terms 1 and 2 together, we find that the function f squared, which is g minus c squared, in uh, L2 norm squared against the measure mu, is bounded from above by 1 over theta times 1 plus bkr over delta times red g squared. And now the final step is to realize <clears throat> that the variance of the measure mu correction, the variance of the function g with, re with respect to the, to the measure mu, is the infimum over all such expressions which are on the left-hand side. So the minimal value <coughs> of all these positive, of, of all these possible numbers, when we vary over possible constant shift c, the minimal value is attained when c is actually chosen to be the mean value of the function g with regards to the measure mu, so therefore, in particular, <clears throat> the variance is bounded from above by this quantity when we make a particular choice of c, which might generally be different from the full mean value of the function g. So, after all, we arrive at the conclusion that the variance <clears throat> uh, of any function g with regards to the measure mu is bounded from above by this constant times the gradient squared of that function g in mu measure. That's exactly the Poincaré inequality. That's correct, suppose, the, suppose for functions g, which are compactly supported or so. This is the case in which you don't have to be worried at all about uh, whether these um, computations of mapping the operator a onto <clears throat> the other type, the other part of the, of the equation on the other side of the integral, 
whether that was admissible or not. So when G is supported, all these computations are uh, correct. And then if you have such an inequality for compactly supported uh, differentiable functions, then by an approximation procedure, by cutoff functions and so forth, you can convince yourself that the corresponding inequality also holds true for all functions G, uh, for instance, on which the right-hand side remains finite. So therefore we have established the Poincaré inequality in this general case. We finished by stating a robust criterion for this gradient drift diffusion case, depending on the behavior of the function h of the energy function, which allows to conclude that there is a finite Poincaré constant, so that we have exponential convergence towards equilibrium. And the criterion goes like this. So suppose you consider such a gradient drift diffusion process with an energy function h. And suppose that the function, the energy function h has asymptotically at least linear growth, which we formulate as follows. Suppose that the gradient of the function h, when taken in the inner product with the function, with, with, the, with the position x, that this grows or has, is bounded from above by below by alpha times the norm of x, at least for x sufficiently large, then we can construct a Lyapunov function which meets the requirements, as stated in the previous theorem, in the form of exponential to the gamma of norm of x for sufficiently large x, and with a certain smoothing, uh, since an absolute value of x, of course, is not necessarily smooth, with a certain smoothing in a, in a, in a ball near the origin, uh, if we construct such a function of this type, then these functions will satisfy the Lyapunov condition as stated in the previous theorem, and therefore we are able to conclude that there is, is a finite Poincaré constant for this drift diffusion processes, which means as a practical message out of all this, that the diffusion process that comes out of this converges to the equilibrium distribution exponentially fast. The fact that such an exponential function will serve as a positive Lyapunov function, as a Lyapunov function applicable to this context, I leave that as an exercise. So this finishes today's segment, and I would like to summarize. So we introduced the notion of a Poincaré constant a Poincaré inequality for the generator of a Feller semigroup, or in general, effectively, for the partial differential operator. We showed that if we have a Poincaré constant, a finite Poincaré constant, then we have exponential convergence towards equilibrium of these diffusion processes. Then we showed that on finite balls and Euclidean space, we have a Poincaré constant, here we refer to the Poincaré constant uh, not with regards to a given generator, but we uh, were using the standard uh, Euclidean energy. Then we concluded, or then we stated that uh, also for perturbations of Euclidean measure on finite balls, we can uh, obtain a finite Poincaré constant. And then we gave a criterion in terms of a Nyapunov function, for the case of a diffusion process on Euclidean space, <clears throat> which is a gradient drift diffusion process, the Lyapunov type condition, which guarantees a finite Poincaré constant, and the finite Poincaré constant that appeared here is a combination of the Lyapunov condition and the finite Poincaré in the Poincaré constant on a finite ball. And ultimately, we gave an application of this uh, to, um, again, gradient drift, uh, gradient drift diffusion processes when we assume that the energy function which gives rise to this gradient drift diffusion, when this energy function has asymptotically linear growth. In this case, we have a Poincaré constant, which means that in this case, we have exponential convergence towards equilibrium.